today, Paul O'Brien, um, who's the chief exec of the Association for Public Service uh, Excellence. And I won't uh, steal Paul's thunder in terms of uh, describing that, but um, just a kind of really great to have Paul here. He's got a wealth of uh, experience uh, kind of beyond uh, beyond that the association um, and is also a fellow of the Royal Society of the uh, Arts and um, I was named in the local government chronicle the LGC as most people call it um, 100 most influential people in local government so it's a real uh, real privilege um, to hear Paul today and you can also uh, find him in the municipal uh, journal magazine uh, sharing his uh, thoughts um, as, as well um, but um, when I kind of found out about the um, about the local government commission 2013 you know really really timely in terms of where we are now at kind of local local government and I didn't plan this but just after the uh, the white paper kind of announcement really important for us to reflect on the future of, of local government so um, without further ado um, I'm going to hand over uh, to Paul O'Brien who's going to um, share his insights um, from that commission over to you Paul. Okay, thanks very much, Noel. Uh, thanks really for the ple It's a real pleasure to be here today talking to you about uh, the findings from our, our work. Who could have imagined really uh, back um, in late 19, when late 2019, when we started our, our work, um, that things would change so much uh, over the next, the next couple of years until we launched uh, our report uh, late last summer. So I'm really going to give you an overview of our work. First of all, I'll say a bit about APSI in just a second, but just to say the, the six main areas of recommendations that came from our work were around uh, re revitalising local government, the roles and powers of local government, a sustainable financial settlement for local government, local democracy, representation and accountability, the local government workforce, and addressing inequalities and engaging communities. And from our work, hopefully we have set out a route map, if you like, as to how we fix the system of local governance, local governance across the UK uh, by 2030, if there's the political will and ambition there really to achieve that. It was interesting Noel mentioned the levelling up uh, white paper. Uh, I was at a session just on Tuesday with Alex Chisholm, who's the Permanent Secretary to the Cabinet Office uh, and who's also Chief Operating Officer for the Civil Service uh, at present. There was a small meeting with just eight of us with him uh, on Tuesday to discuss the white paper. Uh, and I had to swallow 350 pages of the white paper in a couple of days before that meeting to try and be some kind of semi-coherent uh, uh, discussion around about it, but we'll maybe come back. They might, we'll maybe pick up some stuff in the levelling up white paper uh, later. Just a bit about APSI then. Um, we are a local government association owned by our 250 member local authorities from across the UK. Um, I'm joined today, I think, uh, I think Abby has joined us today, uh, who is our principal advisor for the south of the country. Uh, Abby's based out of an office in Oxford uh, for us, um, so Abby perhaps will be in touch with some of you, uh, you know, uh, uh, and later later on, etc. Um, but you're more than welcome to come back to me about this, this uh, the commission work, uh, if you want a chat. Uh, about that also. So I've got a lot to get through. There was 20 recommendations from our work, so I won't waste any longer and I'll get straight into it because I know you want to have some discussions afterwards as well. Hopefully I can make the technology work. Yes, I can. Uh, that was our, our commissioners, uh, a very experienced group from very different backgrounds across the local government spectrum. Um, Thousands of pages of evidence uh, were submitted to us from our original uh, call for evidence. Uh, we interviewed and heard evidence from lots of stakeholders, lots of organisations, lots of representative bodies across the sector and beyond. The Commission group there, I was the chair of the Commission, Lord Gary Porter, who is formerly the chair of the LGA uh, and who also leads uh, for the Conservatives in the House of Lords now was also on the commission. Elma Murray, 
who is the ex-chief exec of North Ayrshire Council in Scotland and who until recently was the vice chair of audit, sorry, the, the acting chair of audit Scotland. Um, Heather Wakefield, some of you may be aware of, uh, former national secretary of for local government for Unison. John Collins, former leader of Nottingham City Council. And Neil Schneider, the former uh, chief exec of Stockton Council up in the North East. So that was the commissioners. We were ably supported by the commission executive of professors Steve Griggs and Ariana Giovannini from De Montfort University and Neil Barnett from Leeds Beckett. So what did we find? Um, this is our final report then, uh, uh, local by default. Uh, there's a link there that you can, uh, if you want to download a copy of the report, you'll get that from our website. But why 2030 then? The current decade will see the UK face some of its biggest challenges since the immediate post-war era, which followed the Great Depression. Um, a decade of austerity where multiple crises around housing, elderly care, and slow economic growth, followed by COVID, have really impacted on opportunity and life chances across the country. And more and more, the public are, are unwilling to accept the status quo. They want something better. And we're seeing social movements uh, spring up across the country that say the system isn't really delivering for me at present. I want something better. And we, we think local government is best can play an integral part in lifting those life chances for people from, from all communities in a real even-handed and fair way if we get it right. There's a need to respond to some of those big pu public policy crises like the climate and ecological emergency, digitalisation moving at pace, more immediately COVID recovery, um, and local government is needed more than ever in this environment. And it's time to recognise that a well-resourced and well-run local government can be in a, a real effective way of re-engaging a disaffected public. And yet for 50 years, um, there's been a long-term reduction in the role, powers and resources of local government as a result of successive governments uh, and their civil servants placing, placing little value in councils and centralising more and more. Councils have been viewed at times with a, a sense of unease by central government as part of the, the problem rather than part of the solution. Viewed as inferior uh, rather than unequal in terms of their democratic legitimacy, um, they've gradually been stripped of their role and resources. So, however, but pressure has been building up. As local government is diminished, those public policy crises I, I mentioned earlier have grown and they need to be resolved locally. The last 10 years have seen real pressure intensify to a point where the, the current system was on the, the verge of breaking. And then COVID came along and exploded the tensions between central and local relations in many ways. The, limitiz the limitizations of, of centralization have been exposed through that, that time. Um, we live in an uneven landscape where, where knowledge of local circumstances is hugely po important as demonstrated through COVID. The current system of local governance in the UK is under severe strain and can sometimes lead to dis dysfunctional outcomes for people. In my view and in, in our, the Commission's view, it's been valiantly held together on a daily basis by the, the heroic efforts of members and officers uh, across the UK. We need to fix this system in order that we can have an effective mechanism for, for navigating those complex issues that society faces today and, and in the future. Looking at our first area of interest then, how we revitalise local democracy, here's what we heard from the evidence. First of all, local government is not viewed as an equal partner by the centre. It's put down, it's overruled, it's bypassed. There's a lot of support there for the constitutional protection of local government's role and powers. Local services have become increasingly fragmented with responsibilities held across many different bodies. Local government should be the steward or custodian of place to join up and integrate local service delivery. There needs to be clarity of role between what is dealt with at a national level a regional level and a local level. And I think that's going to come out more and more as we examine the levelling up uh, white paper as well. 
In our view, there needs to be a realignment of responsibilities to the appropriate level, starting with this principle of local by default. Central local relations require a reset with more protection, powers and freedoms for local government, recognising that certain problems can only be addressed locally and recognising councils play that key role as stewards of place. We need to create synergy to allow scarce resources to go further by getting the system correct rather than inefficiency and bureaucracy by handing down resources through things like bidding pots and or on a piecemeal basis. There needs to be a recognition that each level has its own sphere of governance, its own democratic mandate and equal parity in terms of role and importance. There also needs to be a much greater clarity in the structure of local government in England by 2030. England's the structure of local government in England is a real, a real mess. We need local government's role enshrined constitutionally so that its role and powers are clearly established and not beholden to the whim of the governments of the day, either at Westminster or at the devolved administrations across the, the UK. We need a clearly set out framework and plan for devolution that's based on public service needs of an area rather than presumptions around economic development. Looking then at our first set of recommendations as to how we re revitalise the role of local government, the role, of, the role and powers of local government need to be enshrined constitutionally. Secondly, there needs to be clarity for the public of what sits at the local, regional and national level. It's too confusing at present and the public don't know who to go to at times. Three, there needs to be a clearer devolution framework which identifies the power and funding available to all local authorities based on the principles of subsidiarity, local autonomy and flexibility. I don't quite think the, the level up white paper goes as far as we're calling for there. This should be agreed and developed in partnership between central government, devolved administration and local government rather than decided on a piecemeal basis, which leaves it open to accusations of bias or, at the, or that it's based on, on, on whims or politics. Number four, Based on principles agreed in the framework identified in, in number three, we call for new devolution bills for the nations of the UK, not a one size fits all approach across those nations, but a flexible place based model which improves governance and helps address inequalities. Five, permanent national governance committees should be established across the nations of the UK. If any laws or policy making processes directly affect local government and devolved institutions, um, any, any policies that have been made affect those, then these bodies should be consulted on this. They should have representation from national local government on an equal basis. In terms of roles and responsibilities, then what we heard was give councils a uh, responsibility for tackling those multiple public policy crises we face. Let them transform local areas by, by reshaping, uh, repurposing and regenerating local economies, local infrastructure and maintaining them as places where, where people want to work, live and grow themselves and, and their families. Let them build skilled workforces for not only their needs but that of the wider local economy. Uh, let them develop knowledge and skills within those local workforces to tackle uh, the, the climate and econo ecological emerg emergency over the, the coming decades. Let them house the people who live and work within their area. Let them create the sustainable transport systems for people to move around their areas. Let them coordinate and integrate uh, the, the care services that, the, that support the health and well-being of the public within their area and let them decide the pace of the shift to the digital world and what that means for access to services and delivery platforms. Our recommendations then in this area, local government should be able to determine its own structures, scales and size, organisation configuration and modes of service delivery should be for them to determine to fit with local circumstances and local choice. Seven, there should be an independent, there should be an independent representative standing commission formed in England to which structural reforms, mergers or reductions in scales are submitted to. This would make proposals to central government where, where, whenever legislation is, is required. In terms of eight, local government should have powers transferred to it to integrate local services uh, and have accountability for placed 
based services. Local governments should have responsibility for primary health care, for local policing, for funding for public housing, further education and management of local schools. Finance, the elephant in the room in some senses. Um, a sustainable finance settlement, what we heard. Clearly the current funding system is unsustainable and it's inequitable, hitting the poorest the hardest. The funding of social care needs to be addressed now. There has been too much prevarication that can't go on for much longer. And even the national insurance uh, proposals, you know, the fund, they, they don't really address the funding of social care in many ways. We all know that the the impacts on so that, that this impacts on so many other uh, non-statutory services uh, as well. I think the pandemic has also shown uh, the limitations of the local localization of local government finance and income generation, as well as need for redistribution. Of course, we had a decade there where we were shifting at pace to uh, a, a localized system of local government finance. I think, at the very least, the brakes have been put on that now by 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 COVID. Uh, Competitive bidding approach, approaches, we heard a lot about that. They're inefficient and ineffective. People do not like that. And it can often be those who've got the most resources uh, who are best placed to be successful in those bidding rounds and those that need the money the most uh, through lack of resources uh, are less able to put uh, effective bids uh, forward. There also needs to be a properly funded financial settlement based on need that guarantees a minimum amount of gross domestic product to local government in order to fulfil statutory and core non-statutory responsibilities, plus the ability to raise locally based taxes for local priorities. There must be clear, understandable links for the public to what the tax they are paying is spent on locally, regionally and nationally. In the immediate future, there needs to be a mid to long term financial settlement for local government, whilst the current system is redesigned, business rates are reviewed and council tax is revalued. Our recommendations then in the area of sustainable finance. Firstly, number nine, there needs to be the need, there's a need for a long term sustainable financial settlement. Council should have sufficient resources to exercise their roles and responsibilities and meet the needs of local people. Council should be able to direct this money as they see fit rather than it being ring fenced, subject to democratic accountability. This national settlement should be for a five year minimum period and any further powers or roles and responsibilities that are transferred should bring additional funding. Of course, since our work has been completed, we've had the CSR, the Comprehensive Spending Review 2021, which was for a three year period. But, um, you know, that that's uh, obviously less than we called for. Um, number 10. Um, what happened in the latter half of the of, of the, the last decade <clears throat> took local government funding levels to the lowest point in over 70 years. I think the, the last time they were that low was 1948. That can't be allowed to happen again. Uh, there should be an agreed minimum floor uh, for local government funding as a percentage of gross domestic product. Local government finance needs to be placed in a par in terms of importance with the NHS, with education and the central government. Number 11, the local government sector should be able to decide how funding is allocated between authorities. Number 12, whilst local government will receive a national settlement, a significant proportion of this will still be raised locally. Therefore, there should be a revaluation and reform of council tax and a reform of business rates. In terms of 13, Council should also be allowed to raise additional funding through increases to local taxes, <coughs> apologies, and hypothecated taxes to tackle things like climate change. Probably a good example of that would be the, the workplace parking levy that Nottingham introduced. Excuse me a second. In terms of 14, during the transition to a new longer term settlement, there should be a multi year funding settlement agreed to ensure short term stability uh, and give local government a much needed shot in the arm. 15, there should be principles agreed for uh, the distribution of funds for national programmes rather than 
the bureaucratic, inequitable and wasteful competitive uh, funding processes that people really don't like. Uh, I know actually the, the levelling up white paper has made reference to this and, and accepts the point round about, round about that. Um, local democracy, representation and accountability, what we heard. Uh, models of political leadership and decision making should be chosen locally. Councillors face huge pressures at time, their image needs to be improved and the pool of people standing for election needs to be broadened. Councillors need to be more democratically diverse, uh, sorry, demographically uh, diverse and barriers to election and standing need to be removed for all social groups. Institutional complexity in turn has confused lines of accountability. Councils should be recognised as the democratic anchor of place and should be able to scrutinise effectively all local services that operate within place, within local place, really. What we're calling for is a reinvigoration of local government and the value placed on the, the local democratically elected representatives of local, local people who govern these institutions. Let's get the balance correct between what are council-wide strategic decisions and what are local decisions at a ward level. Let's not exclude those directly elected by local people from decisions that impact on their local neighbourhoods. Let them hold all of all those who provide services in their area that they have been elected to represent accountable on behalf of that local community who elect them, particularly where this involves public funding. There needs to be much greater integration around health, education and housing rather than the fragmentation that we've seen in recent years, uh, or recent decades rather. Value them and reward them reasonably for doing this and you will attract people who are committed to doing this, are effective at doing this and come from all walks of life. Let's make sure the system of local governance works for everyone and that they have an equal chance of being involved in running that system, not excluded from it by design. So our recommendations then in terms of local democracy, representation and accountability. Number 16, uh, there should be no top down imposition of political leadership and organisation. It should be about local choice. Number 17, scrutiny of all local services should be strength strengthened uh, with formal rights to information. We call for the establishment of local public accounts committees. Councils also need to be open to independent scrutiny. Number 18, councillors should better reflect the diversity of all of their local communities. Councils should embrace fully the public sector equality duty to help tackle discrimination and create and report on local action plans on progress on their efforts to ensure access to political office for all. This should be supported by national uh, local government bodies and associations. 19. A national remuneration scheme should be established for councillors uh, to come in line with Wales, Scotland and Northern Ireland. In Wales, Scotland and Northern Ireland, councillor allowances are set at a national level. In England, there are still local decisions that are played out in the press every year um, as to what councillor allowance, councillors' allowances should be. And in many instances, they're much, much lower than the national agreed rates that are set in Wales, Scotland and Northern Ireland. So national remuneration bodies should also make recommendations on how council, councils can best support councillors and ensure access to public, political office for all. In terms of organisation in the workforce, what we heard, local government structure, structures in England are confusing. There's no real agreement on organisational size, which is appropriate to all areas. Severe cuts to staff numbers over the past decade uh, for some sort, some services have been hit much worse than others. Um, working conditions and paying rewards between that are different between local government and other public sector bodies. Uh, put the local government staff being the poor relations when you get think about things like uh, cleaning uh, cleaning services, for example. You know, it, it doesn't make any sense that cleaners in local government are paid £2,000 less than they are paid in the NHS, for, for example. The top end of local government remains unrepresentative of, of women. Job cuts across local government impacted the most on women. 
BAME communities and people with disabilities are also hit badly uh, by, tho by, those, uh, by those cuts also. Career pathways must be more identifiable if we want to attract and retain talent in local government. Let elected members set a vision for a well-trained and highly motivated officer corps, reflective of the local community, to implement on behalf of local communities. Let's invest in developing leadership, but also training at all levels of local government, creating clear career paths for the workforce. Let's get organisational culture uh, correct with the workforce, having a greater involvement in decision making. Local people from all communities delivering services for the local community as a whole that they live within to provide an improved quality of life for all of the people that they walk amongst. Providing an integrated set of services directly uh, that are not only democratically accountable, but flexible and adaptable to local people's needs as public policy priorities uh, change. And ensuring that local supply chains from the private and third sectors are fully developed and involved in supporting this work and helping grow the concept of social value in the local economy. Let's find better ways of engaging with all communities within the local area and reconnect with the next generation whose future uh, is going to be hugely dependent on decisions that are made on the big public policy conundrums of our time. Let's reach out and involve them in that decision making prog progress. On to our, 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 our last area, our, 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 more or less getting towards the end of our recommendations. To our recommendation 20, the Commission supports the introduction of a duty for the local government workforce to be representative of its communities, reporting annually on progress with us. We call for a national linked system of paying conditions across the public sector to ensure equivalent jobs across the, the public sector are rewarded equally. Sorry, I've never uh, put that slide on, but that's it there that I've just spoken about. And the next slide as well, uh, recommendation 22, we call for career pathways into local government and training for career development opportunities for those already in, and for career development opportunities for those already in the system. There's also a need for workforce planning to counter the ageing the aging population. There's a need to attract and upskill the workforce around the environment and climate change, digitalisation and the care economy, um, recovery after the pandemic will surely demand a focus on this. 23, democratically accountable integrated services which are provided directly are the most flexible and adaptable to local people's needs uh, and should be the default option where they are best able to deliver high quality, effective and socially just outcomes for local people. Final area, addressing inequalities and engaging communities. What we heard, cuts to local services combined with welfare payments have disproportionately impacted on women, particularly BAME women, lone parents and disabled women. Uh, services to young people have, have also been cut significantly uh, and there's a real need to think about the impacts of policies on future generations continuously. Capacity has fallen in the voluntary and community sectors with an increasing dependency on income generation. Councils have acted as buffers amongst against some of the worst of the cuts but can't tackle the impacts of inequalities on their own. Renewed focus requires, is required on cooperation, uh, community planning and citizen assemblies for things like climate. Councils working increasingly around the foundational uh, and caring economy approaches. Number 24, councils should use a principle of care to engage with all communities and voices within their areas using multiple approaches to involve local people in decision making. 25, councils should view long term decision making through the lens of future generations, considering carefully the impacts on current and future generations. There's a great piece of legislation in Wales called, called the Future Generations Act uh, that puts a duty on all uh, councils to, uh, to to look at things through the, the prism of future generations, if you like. Uh, it's, it's, worth a, it's worth a look at. Uh, 26, councils should comply with the public sector equality duty fully and do meaningful equality impact assessments to evaluate how policies impact on their diverse communities. 27, councillors' role should be enhanced through expanding ideas around individual councillor budgets. The principle should also be that councillors have the right to be engaged in anything that impacts on, on their, in their ward. 28, councils should use their spend to maximise the, their impact in the local economy to support inclusive growth and community well-being. So how do we fix the system? Um, 
a list of recommendations there that that's, that's wide. You, you, I'm sure you'll recognise that. Uh, a route map to achieving better governance in the UK. In order to achieve that system change we propose by 2030, we either need a big bang approach or rapid incremental change that moves at pace towards fixing that system. We're calling for ministers within the UK government and the devolved administrations to, to champion this change by building into their programmes of government. We believe that the establishment of a Royal Commission on Local Governance or a Constitutional Convention would be alternative ways uh, of doing this, which could build broad cross-party support for change. Or a more incremental approach would be overseen by national governance committees based on the principle of sub subsidiarity at pace. But let's reset the system by adopting the principle of local de by default. Let's improve local governance across the UK Let's tackle inequality. Let's reconnect communities with public services and make the system work for all. Thanks for listening. I know there was a lot uh, there uh, to listen to. Apologies for that, but it was two years, two years worth of worth of work. Thanks, Noel. That was really great, Paul. And um, yeah, some some really important areas. And there's there's already some some specific recommendations that. Um, that kind of I'm I'm kind of picking up for 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 my for my own council, so saves us saves us some of the work to to do. Um, I was going to ask you a kind of a question, like just building on the leveling up white paper and kind of where where the government thinking is is where are the windows or what are the windows of opportunity for local government vis-a-vis -vis influencing central government? So where, in a way, where should we place our bets as local councils as, as the areas that where there's most likely to be kind of change or movement or openness from government on some of these some of these things? Um, I'm not sure who's on the call today, so I need to be careful what I'm saying here. But um, I, 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 th I think the um, certainly my prep for the meeting I mentioned the, the, the other day, um, the white paper, it, it, it could be some some people may take the view right that the white paper uh, is, is is a series of announcements that have been made over the last couple of years that have been brought together to demonstrate that leveling up as as an approach. Um, and there's a lot there is a lot of re announcements in there. I actually like the ambition of the white paper, the the six uh, capitals the five pillars and the 12 missions uh, identifies. Uh, I'm sure a lot of your policy people, you will appreciate, uh, uh, you know, the, 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 the width of uh, uh, the breadth of a pr approach there that's been adopted. I think it's less clear on the actual implementation and the uh, how the deliverables of, of, of all of this. And I think that's there to be shaped. That's there to be fought for. Um, my message was that you will not uh, achieve uh, levelling up in any way whatsoever if you don't engage local government fully in this. If you treat local government as something somewhere over there, you know, then you know you will struggle. And it comes back to me for that that spheres of influence approach. Um, uh, sorry, spheres of governance approach. What sits at a national level? What sits at a regional level? What sits at a local level? I was hammering some of those points. I also hammered the point about the impact of austerity over the last decade and the impact that that's had on local place, uh, what local place looks like, the infrastructure of local place. And if we really are going to achieve levelling up, then there's a catch up, first of all, for, for all areas. You know uh, that needs sustained capital and revenue uh, investment. I also think there's a fundamental role for local government to play there. Uh, there could be a similar approach adopted here as to the Climate Change Act. If you think about the system we have in place to achieve net zero, we have the Climate Change Act that uh, that, that that places in law um, a duty on the UK to achieve net zero by 2050. We then have a sixth carbon budget um, that, that, that that's overseen by the Climate Change Committee that identifies those step changes, that, that those 
changes that we need to take in five year periods between now and then to remain on target and achieve that drive towards net zero by 2050, stage by stage, step by step. We have local authorities who have declared climate and ecological emergencies across the country as well. So you start to see a connection there, a system there. I think levelling up has got to be the same. I think there's all to play for there because, you know, I, I, I think we should be making the arguments about what we can do to help deliver levelling up. Sorry if that's a bit long winded, no, but it's it's quite a complex topic. As I said, it's 353 pages of my life that I will never get back having read that the other day. Yeah. No, 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 absolutely. It is a, it is a, it is a wide, it is a wide ranging, a wide ranging paper. Um, and I haven't, I, haven't, I wouldn't say that I've read all, all three, all 300 pages. Uh, the kind of, the, you probably start with the exact summary. Um, there's a kind of, the, there's a, a question here in terms of, um, I guess you've picked it up in kind of, in your, in your response just now, but around there's increasing trends in kind of increasing centralization yeah. um so how how do how do we overcome this um this kind of trend um I, I, my own view of that is that that's been a direction of travel for the last 50 years you know um and um it seems to get worse all the time um we need to uh, as i say probably prove that we're part of the solution rather than uh, rather than the problem, uh, which I believe we are, but not everyone's convinced of that. And I think we need to show that we can make a positive contribution in terms of things like the levelling up agenda, you know, that, that we're part of, of the answer there and, and help uh, build that trust. But I think it's actually the central side of it that's got the problem rather than local government having the problem. You know, with that, um, so uh, you know, um, but uh, I, I, I probably think in terms of levelling up as well, um, there was a, a renewed emphasis in the white paper on data and performance data and um, measures at the local level to on quality of life and all of this that, that's going to re-emerge and we have a um after a decade um where we abolished the audit commission um you know we have proposals out there now that there will be something that's akin to what the audit commission did which they're not allowed to call the audit commission because that would look like they made a mistake in abolishing it in the first place right so so i i think there will be again um data not to the extent it was back before 2010 but i think there will be data that will be required to gather at the local level that measures um whether leveling up is being achieved whether improved quality of life is being achieved in that. You can't do that without local government. You just can't, you can't do that. But I think there'll be a responsibility on us at the local level. And I think we need to engage in that to make sure it's something that's worthwhile, that's something that's achievable, rather than something that's impractical, that's imposed upon us. So I think we need to engage in that debate about that. No, absolutely. And, and just, um, just on that, um, and kind of, kind of might be biased given we're talking about local government and there are other public sectors uh, kind of out there but I guess local government is one of the the more kind of accountable um, mm. areas of the public sector and particularly from a financial perspective um, yeah. I was just 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 thinking that um, so, so, so some sometimes the general public don't necessarily see the difference between different levels mm -hmm. of government you know whether, whether it's local central or anything anything between is 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 there something more that councils need need to do um with with their kind of local residents in terms of kind of sharing that story but also sharing that story in order to have potentially difficult conversations about the trade-offs that need to be made about priorities within a, a really difficult financial context. Uh, yes, absolutely. I, I, I agree with you that wholeheartedly. I think, you know, probably there's, there's so many things springing through my head just now about that and all, but I mean, there's, there's the difficult conversations that are, have already started with regards to climate 
you know, on climate action and what that means for people in, you know, up in the Greater Manchester where I'm based. Uh, you know, we're go, we're we've got a greater uh, the Greater Manchester low emission zone that's about to well was about to be brought into play. Uh, it was hugely unpopular with the public. Um, you know, uh, and we need to engage on the reasons the reasons why that is it's important that we take action on these type of things, the impact that it has on children's health if we don't, if we just continue to have air pollution, etc. Um, you know, we, we, we need to make that case. We need to work with all those partner bodies at the local level to get that, uh, get those arguments across. We can't be arguing against each other. Um, but I, I, as you say, I think there's a democratic legitimacy to local government at the local level. I think we need to um, uh, uh, revalue, if you like, the work that local councillors can do and empower them more and build up that role so that that becomes more recognisable to the public that they are their champion, you know. Uh, and if you give them more power of uh, over or more influence over all of the things that take place at the local level, then I think the public will start to recognise that important role to play uh, ever more. I think also around that, if you look at it, I think it's a point you touched on again, No, um, it's the same people, isn't it, that vote for councillors, that vote for MPs, you know, and vote for combined authorities and mayors and things like that. It's the same people, so there should be a recognition that people have the same level of democratic mandate cause from, from the public as well. It's just to do different things. They do it local, regional, and national. So, but and there's a there's a there's a question here about what your th thoughts are about how um, the development of integrated care systems plays into um, all of this with the relationship with local government. I don't know if you had any thoughts about that. Yes, it's interesting. I read I read an article about I, I, I seen some diagrams that were put out there yesterday about who's going to chair um, integrated care bodies and uh, uh, um, uh, uh, and things. Um, I, I, I think the, the, the principles interesting. They've already have integrated uh, uh, joint boards in Scotland for a few years now, you know. I think there's mixed views on the success of that and when it comes to allocating resources. You know, uh, my experience of partnerships over the past 30, 30 odd years, too many years probably, you know, uh, uh, is that we, at the outset, there's lots of great talk um, about everything that can be achieved. Um, um, but when it comes to actual giving away some of your resources, people seem to have more difficulty with regards to that, with sharing resources. And uh, when times get tougher and priorities are placed upon them, they tend to um, focus on the things that are closest to them. So, yeah, I mean, the integrated care system, if we get it right, could 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 help, um, could make things more efficient and more effective um, and better. For for people, I, I I'm still I still think there's a bit of the journey to go on that in terms of getting getting the the structures correct, uh, um, and the resources allocated correctly as well. Great, and there's um there's there's a there's a few people here from um from the kind of voluntary and kind of ch charitable mm. um sector. Yeah. And thinking, obviously, there's a relationship between local government and central government mm. and, and the NHS, but also with other players at kind of that much more local, local based base level. Yeah. Um, with with the kind of the different, um, I guess, tr like trends or directions that kind of the commission is, is, is su uh, suggesting, um, what's the different relationship that um, local government and the voluntary sector should have the kind of pick up those principles. Yeah, um, I mean, I think we heard a lot of evidence um, from the community and voluntary sectors. Um, we looked at concepts like community wealth building and social value uh, quite a lot as well. Um, and I think it's important that we recognise to, to build uh, effective local economies, effective local communities, 
it's it's important that we try to ensure that there's there's as little uh, leakage from those local economies as possible, and that we maximise the talents uh, within those local economies in terms of uh, bus local businesses, supplies and services, etc. Uh, we did we did work uh, about uh, 2006, which was the early work on community wealth building with Claes, who have been heavily involved in that. We, we were kind of partner, orga we still are partner organisations for years, um, but we did a piece of work in Swindon about measuring the economic footprint of uh, of of local place and uh, of, of local government spend within the local area and we staff keeping spend diaries and all sorts of things, you know, and we looked at, but what we found even then was that um, whilst it was 95.6% of the the staff who provided those services who lived within the main two Swindon postcodes, the supply chain, there was only 32% of this the supply chain spend that was within that local area. And it's about building up those local supply chains. Preston's a great example that I've done that successfully in terms of of uh, of community wealth building, where they've created lots of jobs on the back of they've managed to keep their spend locally uh, and invest in those local uh, suppliers, the local community groups, you know, and so on and so forth. So I think there's a real, you know, uh, there's a new real need to join all that up, integrate it all uh, for the benefit of of local communities. Great. Um, and f final final question: What what kind of the the next steps that um, kind of your association are, are kind of doing on building on the kind of recommendations from the from yeah. the commission? Yeah. Well, we we have there's a lot we're doing round about. We've been we we we've been to all all of the political conferences, doing fringe meetings. Obviously, this is when the reports went to ministers. It's went to political parties, it's went to anybody who would take a copy of it from us, if you like. Um, but as I say, I had a meeting just the other day with, and I was, my, my response to the levelling up white paper was very much built on this. Um, we have looked at um, uh, model motions for councils um, to adopt the principles of local by default. Um, the jury's still out on that just a little bit um, because we worry that it becomes more closely associated with one political party than another, whereas we see it as something that's that, you know, I mean, I, I, I've I've spoken now at this and been really well received everywhere it's went, but I've, I'm thinking now I've spoken at Labour conference on it. I've had the main stage at Conservative Councillors Association conference for the last two years, and I'm going back this year on it. Uh, I've spoken to SNP conference about it as well. And there's a lot of, but these things don't just happen overnight. You need to build up that support for it. You know, but my own fear is, just leave you with this point, no. All those big public policy crises that are building up about the climate and ecological emergency, about housing shortages, about skills, um, about uh, the ageing population, about social care, all, all of those things, the current system has really, really struggled to cope with them. Unless we fix the system, we'll really struggle to address those issues in the coming decade. Local government's got to be at the heart of that. Absolutely, and I, I think on, on on that on that point, let, let's close that here. But I think there's some really there's some really rich food for thought, and um, you know, we could. Uh, definitely for future sessions we could look at individual themes and, and get get into them and we'll we'll share we'll share your slides uh paul so that people can have a look at kind of specific recommendations that um that they might want to take forward in in their council or, or to kind of follow up with you and um and your your colleagues but um before we leave, if we could um, un unmute ourselves and give Paul uh, a big, a big round of applause for for your presentation. Thanks a lot. Thanks very much, everybody, for taking the time out today to listen and, and engage. Thank you very much. That was, any, time, that was... any time at all, no, any time at all. No, I, 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 absolutely. I think that would be that that would be that would be really great. And and thank you for taking your taking your time out uh, kind of over lunch to uh, to share with us uh, that so we will we as I said we will share the recording so you can share with uh, colleagues and we'll also uh, share uh, the, the, the the slides as as well 
and uh, do check out kind of our session uh, next week, which is all about um, insights on civic strengths in uh, London uh, as well. Mm. Uh, so thank you, everyone. Have a good rest of the afternoon, and thanks again. Uh, thanks, Noel. Thanks, Dave.